Uh, yeah, thanks again for the nice introduction. Um, as we talked a little bit about the about the program, about the study program uh, that you are leading um, and uh, in which framework this is uh, taking place, I thought I really put the interdisciplinarity on top of the uh, of the talk, uh, the introduction to my work and try to intertwine this with um, art science collaboration and art science collaboration case studies, but also how to do these projects in order to make them really valuable for everybody who participates. So uh, you introduced me so nicely and generously, uh, but uh, again, a, a little bit about me and my back background. So I'm, I'm a researcher, uh, really coming from social and economic sciences and cultural studies. And um, I've been working in uh, understanding how bringing art into other fields um, affects other fields, but also the people in these fields or, or the groups. Uh, for quite some time now, uh, nearly 15 years, um, studying about uh, working on artistic interventions, what do artistic interventions do, uh, trying to understand how this relationship on the cultural, social, psychological level between arts and, and, and other fields relates. But um, very soon I found it's, it's extremely important to work in practice, work with artists, work with organizations, work with, with people who experience these uh, interactions. So I decided to, to do both, uh, to do research and go on in the research because there is, uh, this feels quite, uh, quite small, especially when it comes to specific interventions, um, artistic interventions. Um, yeah, and uh, to try to understand what's happening in the field and what's interesting and what it really does to the big people and organizations. And um, one aspect that was very prevalent already when I studied or when I studied was uh, that diversity is important, that interdisciplinarity is important in order to create really interesting research with interesting technologies, but also uh, leads to, uh, to innovation in organizations. I found it very puzzling from my social science and cultural science perspective that this idea of, of, of creativity is always at the forefront and innovation is always at the forefront and, and art is some kind of a, um, an important aspect for innovation and creativity, but nobody really thinks about all these deeper layers of, of engagement and uh, at least in, in these very high level decision making um, uh, uh, levels of organizations or policymakers. So there's always these, these shortcuts and there's so much more happening and uh, so much more engagement with the arts uh, necessary so that it can be really impactful. So I decided to, to go further into this direction. But um, I want to start a little bit introducing this bigger picture of what's happening around art science collaboration, but also uh, how to bring art science, uh, art and science, art and technology, but also in, in whatever kind of context, in cultural, cultural context, but also in corporate or scientific context together. Um, and why there is currently this big um, longing for, for bringing art into all these different, uh, uh, yeah, in all these different fields. So um, right now there are a few very important things that are uh, especially interesting for policymakers and for corporations. And First of all, of course, there is innovation, creativity, inspiration. We need innovation. We need to develop what we do. We need to bring uh, or come up with something new so that we can make money or that we can develop and that we can defend our leading position in the world of whatever we do. So um, this is the one big thing and um, that is also leading, for example, discussions around uh, starts uh, the, the, the activities from the European Commission around bringing arts into uh, science and, and uh, technology development settings. Of course, uh, there is a little bit of a different direction. It's, it's 21st century skills, which also uh, 
is somehow a call for interdisciplinarity and, and bringing art and design also into these um, educational uh, settings, but also into settings like management education or organizations to develop these uh, major skills of communication, uh, creativity again, um, critical thinking uh, and collaboration. So really trying to understand how we can learn to collaborate uh, across boundaries. And then there's two things that are very important around art science and, or, and, and art and technology right now is humanized technology and digital humanism. So um, there are different, different parts of the world and, and different corporations and different uh, political organizations framing this a little bit differently, but it's all about what is the future that we want to live in and how do we create some kind of a livable future. And people started to turn uh, to not only interdisciplinary settings, but also to the arts to understand how can we bring in a more critical reflection, but also a more emotional and, and a more humane um, perspective to the development of what we want to do and what, how we want to develop our, uh, our world around us with the technology that we are developing and using. And then there are more political goals. These are the sustainable development goals from the European Commission. So what do we want to tackle in our future research and future activities? And of course, the global challenges, uh, which are also something that have been that has been researched over the last uh, 15, 20 years, depending on which organization you're looking at. Uh, I think the um, uh, the Millennium Project is now ongoing for 24 years, researching what are global challenges and what is what we need to to tackle. And again. Everywhere there is some kind of a call for interdisciplinarity, but also for bringing art, because art brings something very interesting. Nobody really says something very concrete, but art brings something interesting, something humane or creativity or uh, new directions and new perspectives. So summing up this, this call for inter, but also transdisciplinarity. Um, I think some, some of the studies are not very clear here. So there is interdisciplinarity bringing together different disciplines to work together, but also transdisciplinarity uh, to work outside the pure academic uh, world and bring in uh, citizen science and, and public engagement and other dimensions uh, that can benefit um, these projects. Um, there are a lot of different studies claiming that it's important to have transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, and they are also always all pointing to um, to also including arts as a very important aspect. So, for example, of course, the STEAM education, uh, all these studies around STEAM education, tackling uh, the ideas of skill development are um, about how do we use art and, and what can art bring to our science, technology, uh, engineering, math education? Um, what kind of skills does the experience and the creation of art bring to these people? But then there are other aspects, for example, the OECD study on transdisciplinarity explicitly talks about bringing art um, as, a, uh, as a means for making or creating effective um, projects that really can solve problems, um, that can solve uh, problems like, um, it was for example, uh, they, they make this example of um, the Ebola <laughs> um, epidemic in, uh, I think four years back, where art was a, a, a specific tool to raise awareness, but also to include as much people as possible into the process to overcome uh, the most uh, tragic situations there. And then uh, again, as I, as I mentioned before, uh, the Starts Initiative from the European Commission, which is, or it started out to be mainly about innovation, creativity, and bringing somehow technology and, and latest applied research to the market, but also to, to a more general public, including the arts and exploring all these possibilities there. And then there is one thing I wanted to 
ed uh, because it's also about skill development and it's about how do we tackle these global challenges and how do we, we deal with what we have in our dealing with, with societies, but also with organizations and with uh, the technologies we develop. It's the Carnegie Report from 2011. The Carnegie Report actually reports on how management education should develop. And the famous Carnegie Report from the 1950s originally tried to push management very much into a technical direction and saying, oh, it has to be technical, it's very rational, there are key numbers that managers need to know so that they can make the right decisions. And this Carnegie report actually finally goes into a completely different direction saying we need humanities, we need uh, design processes, we need insights from the arts, we need uh, insights from philosophy and we need the social sciences more than ever also in um, management um, education so that there can be this adequate skill development so that all these ma future managers can deal with uh, the situations that they are confronted with within global challenges this is tackling 17 uh, SDGs whatever so it's very very close to this call for steam education um, and it's also recognized in, in, in um, public, but also within the uh, very leading uh, managers in big tech companies, for example. So Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, also reflecting back on, on the beginnings of Twitter said, oh, wow, there are a lot of uh, different things that we did not do because we were only thinking rationally. And we did not think about including social scientists, uh, understanding how, how what we do would um, affect social dynamics. Uh, we didn't think about psychology and, and uh, behavioral science. So uh, this is something that's a very loud and clear call for inter and transdisciplinarity in whatever we do. So, um, uh, just summing a little bit up, um, what do, do all these different studies and different calls um, have in common? It's about bringing together different disciplines and really acknowledging that um, going into different um, levels of understanding and knowledge is important for uh, solving a problem, but uh, it's not only about solving the problem together. It's not only about bringing different perspectives or methodologies or understanding the context in which this problem takes place from different perspectives as seen from different disciplines, but they also reach out to other dimensions like skill development in education, but also in practice. How does this uh, being exposed to different kinds of thinking processes, uh, methodologies, also affects our skills and our skills in dealing with these very complex problems. But also, of course, there is something like creating uh, new possibilities to connect to the outside. So there is a lot of talk about communication of key issues through various new ways of storytelling, reaching out to different groups of people. But this is not all, not, not only the public engagement dimension is interesting, it's also how this helps us to bring in these different uh, voices from outside of academia and outside of specific disciplines into our projects and into how we solve the projects and how we create more holistic approaches. And of course, and, and here, especially also art comes in, it does not only help the project to uh, reach out of the inner circle to, to a greater public, but also to bring in a critical reflection from the outside. How does the public, uh, a specific cultural perspective, see what we do when we, for example, create a, a, um, an, a, a critical uh, artistic project on what's going on in technology development or what would be possible in, uh, in, in, in technology development when we think this further. So uh, a, a really interesting, uh, quite a few interesting examples that I can't show today 
unfortunately, um, I'm working with right now are dealing with uh, data science and algorithmic decision making. So how do we as an RD or how do artists reflect on what's happening in the field, but also reflect on uh, critical issue, issues around predictive policing or around um, uh, facial recognition uh, and, and talk about it in a level to, to bring it to the extreme of what could happen or reflect critically and how can this then back inform what's going on in research and in also deployment of these uh, different uh, technologies. So uh, I, I tried to give the, the bigger overview first, and I now really want to focus more on the context of art science collaboration and something that I did from my perspective. So um, something that I, from taking again a step back, there are, are all these beautiful effects and all these beautiful desirable things that imp or impacts that we want to have through interdisciplinary work, through, um, through bringing arts into these art science projects. But what is it actually from a, a social scientific, from a psychological or from a, a humanities or cultural science point of view, that happens in these projects that makes them so valuable. And um, in the years starting 2016, uh, based on previous research work that I did, uh, but also studying very specifically uh, working on art science projects in different contexts in scientific, but also in organizational contexts, I wanted to understand these dynamics and, and using all these different tools and theories I had at hand from, from my previous education. So I tried to understand um, what happens in these projects very generally, but also in the process of the projects so that they are really so beneficial and so interesting um, and not just a, a nice, a nice add-on. So uh, these are a list of examples of, of theories that I explored. Um, I would I won't go into the detail of all of them, but I will single out a few and 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 connect them also uh, with artistic and aesthetic uh, dimensions so that we really can talk about what makes art so, so special in the mix. And um, but then there are others that I, I won't go into depth and uh, for example, understanding um, art science collaboration, the benefit of art science collaboration from a social networks perspective. In social sciences, social network theory talks about how we are connected to other nodes and to other people um, who have, again, uh, connections. So for example, when we start to connect between art and sciences, we suddenly have a lot of more a lot more resources and a lot more information at hand. And this automatically leads to a higher uh, yeah, probability that we find something interesting and we could be creative or we can make innovative connections. Um, so I just will start with a few projects and, and, and talk about a little bit about the theory. So I, I try not to go too, to become too theoretical because so please remind me if I get too theoretical or if I'm, I'm too fast, let me know. Um, I, I'm happy to explain also in more depth, uh, but I, I figured that I tend to become a little bit too theor theoretical sometimes. So starting very basically with interdisciplinary collaboration, I wanted to show uh, this, uh, it's just a, a play, placeholder image in the end, uh, this uh, project or uh, space at NASA. So NASA has the studio at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory which is a place that really is about interdisciplinary collaboration and future thinking. So they are very much interested in artistic perspectives, but a little more in design perspectives and design processes to create really the fundament for future projects. So when some, some new missions, before even before missions start and before new directions are really uh, decided upon, they 
go with the projects to this interdisciplinary room and work with, scient uh, with scientists and, and engineers but, and with designers and, and also sometimes invite artists to get a new perspective and really to start from scratch. Uh, interdisciplinary collaboration in a more in a more specific uh, and interesting um, direction is, for example, um, there is a lot of talk around can AI make music and 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 how can we program a computer to be creative and and to be a composer. But um, actually, it's much more interesting even for computer scientists to really work with an artist and to explore different dimensions. And as soon as a computer scientist and an artist and a musician work together, uh, in this case on a semantic machine that uh, creates uh, ambient music, uh, depending on where you are in the world, um, what time of the day it is, uh, what weather you have, are there clouds, what kind of temperatures there, and so on. And creating the, these dynamics, um, the computer scientist who actually is also an, uh, an educator, at least he's educated as, as a musician, but he's not, he's more practitioner uh, in, his, in his free time. Um, they could explore new dimensions and understand what is necessary to program and to put into this um, into this project from a computer scientific perspective. Because as a computer scientist, even if you have musical background, you might end up into a loop of habitual blindness because you only see what you see as uh, as what your what your interest in, interest in is and where you want to go and what you plan to do with this thing. But as soon as another musician who is really, uh, who really wants to explore creatively um, comes into play, a uh, completely new, um, a different depth of, uh, of for example, uh, coding and, and structuring and complexity for the creation of this semantic machine uh, was developed and could be developed. And even um, another uh, scientist in this field of uh, uh, machine learning and music, who originally was very, very, um, rest uh, very conservative, thinking, um, yeah, but why? I, I have the I have this music theory, and why should I talk to to a musician? Because I know all this. Uh, was con convinced. Um, over time that it's really interesting to work with a musician because it gives them a completely different depth of uh, craft skill, but also what is ne necessary to really explore creatively. Um, also a really interesting case of interdisciplinary collaboration, but here I want to show contextualization as, as, as the main as the main issue is um, Sarah Kraski's work uh, with the uh, bioprocess laboratories in, in Basel and Zurich um, where she worked with a team uh, on uh, that's interested in, in synthetic bi uh, biology and how to uh, deal with infectious diseases uh, through these uh, sympeptides that they are developing or, uh, and also bypassing antibiotic resistance. Um, she was exploring uh, a more broader context and a broader um, uh, a context of the laboratory, the local context of, of finding uh, or historical co context because Basel was uh, a center uh, of a pharmaceutical center in history, uh, and she started to uh, link um, historical data, uh, more broad knowledge about how to fight infectious diseases with the work uh, in the synthetic biology laboratory. And she pointed the scientists to garlic, uh, which was traditionally used in this uh, region as um, yeah, to handle infectious diseases. So they created, or she created, 
uh, peptides um, to cure or to cure cholera based on um, garlic. And it's not only interesting that she started to push uh, the scientists into new directions through her contextualization work, because she also linked them up to the pharmaceutical museum. They brought in new interesting perspectives that then they could follow up in their research. She even uh, asked them why she would not, why they would not use a specific uh, uh, a specific method in producing these peptides and a, a specific uh, laboratory or part of the laboratory. And they said, yeah, because we know what will happen. And in the end, they didn't know what would ha what will happen and something completely unexpected happened. So they even had to follow up scientifically what happened there and why it did not turn out as they expected. So again, um, interdisciplinary collaboration can have all these different aspects and artists through their uh, very, um, uh, broad uh, approach and, and contextualization approach at the beginning can start out to create interesting connections, but also through the, their perspectives in the interdisciplinary collaboration can point to new uh, paths and questions. But it's not only paths and questions, uh, the context can be important in a completely different way. So, and this is a, a project that is uh, a favorite of many, many people I'm, I'm talking to. It's the project uh, Tattoo by Appropriate Audiences, uh, realized in 2016 at the Autodesk B9 residency. And uh, three French artists went to uh, Autodesk for the residency program because they wanted to um, create a robotic tattoo machine. Um, they started out with a 3D printer as a robotic tattoo machine, but they wanted to turn to the huge industrial robot arms. And in the end, it's also something that even the future science uh, or future tech group at Autodesk had in mind before, that they wanted to bring the uh, robot arms closer to, to, to people and the most extreme this, so the scientists and engineers could think of was tattooing, but nobody would ever let them do. So when the artists came, the scientists and uh, engineers were super happy because they finally could real, realize this project and communicate a very, very, very important part to the rest of the company that it's really important that these arms are not just restricted um, in restricted areas, but that people in the future really want to interact with them. But that's not all. And, and here again, the context comes into place because now it's the context of the engineers and scientists. They had to talk to their uh, safety department and the safety department was not amused about this idea. So they really tried to, um, uh, they really convinced them and suddenly from, and of course, a safety department has to be more conservative and has to think about all these aspects of what could happen and they have to make sure that uh, no human will be harmed. But um, starting this conversation and starting this project was so important for them that the head of the safety department suddenly turned into uh, one of the most important uh, people in this field, uh, getting invited by, uh, a lot of different conferences talking about what will be the future of safety in terms of uh, working close with robots and industrial robotic machines. So it just opened up a completely different directions. Nobody really thought of, but it's again this something can happen in the context and you either establish the com context through your artistic work or you have to include somebody in the contextual uh, surroundings of the project that then leads to um, actual real innovation. Uh, I feel I'm, I'm a little bit fast, so I, I hope there are no questions or... <laughs> yeah, I mentioned, sorry, I mentioned to, to say in the beginning, if you have any questions, please uh, uh, write them in the chat and we collect them at the end and... Um... 
and uh, so we make sure that we don't uh, lose any questions or comments also. Uh, or Claudia, I don't think you would prefer to be interrupted. I think it's it, it's maybe better to do it in the end, right? Okay, yeah, uh, I, that's that's fine with me. I just don't want to go too fast at, at a certain point in time, and then. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, good. So we go to a completely different theoretical background and another project. So. <laughs> So um, the video is it does not say much, but I wanted to, to show it up front. Um, the project was uh, a speculative design, or started out as a speculative design project where at, um, when I still was at Us Electronica, we were involved in this EU project Sparks uh, about the future of technology and health. And we realized three residencies, and this was one of them uh, about the future of technologies in, in, in the health sector. Uh, so we worked with Anouk Lieprecht, um, who wanted to create some device for children on the autism spectrum. And you might say, oh, it, it's sitting very loose and it might not be so interesting from a neuroscientific perspective because um, it's, it's a 3D printed device uh, using uh, PCI uh, uh, or, or an EEG sensors, specific sensors for um, uh, understanding the brain waves, uh, for measuring the brain waves. Um, and it, it might be a little bit, it's sitting a little bit loose and might not be the best form as a unicorn form, uh, for children on the autism spectrum, but if they hurt themselves and so on and so forth. Yes, there might be an, a few of these questions, but what, in, what was interesting there was uh, what happened with the people uh, working with Anouk in this space. And here I really want to point to this idea of liminal spaces and uh, the theory of liminality. So um, we put, we brought uh, Anouk together with um, uh, with Chitak, a producer and a company producing these sensors, but also researching them with a neuroscientist, with a therapist at, um, who is dealing with these kids. Uh, but we also opened other discussions with um, uh, with an interest group of parents and so on. And this project actually have helped um, the company, but also the therapist to step out of their daily routines and explore a field that might not seem interesting to them at first sight. So the theory of liminality is actually coming from anthropology. And it's talking about phases um, where you change a position, for example, a status in your group. And it's a phase where you're not restricted to typical routines and restrictions. And when we draw the line to our nowadays organizations, uh, we are restricted by routines. What do we have to do in order to fulfill our duties in our organization? What do we have to do in this, or it, it, it's, what uh, do we have to do to comply with our status in the organization? Because there are managers, because there are people higher ranked and so on and so forth. But it also complies with a certain kind of status as a scientist or as the technologies, for example, technologists, for example, because of course, 
uh, it's very difficult when you're in a scientific environment to create something that looks weird and crazy and not and, and more experimental and like a fun project than substantial research. So this project actually was able to create this kind of space for a few people at Cheetah, but also, for example, for the therapist to allow them to get out of their roles of their daily business and think about this in a different way and contribute to this project. And although this project is not something that is really useful or is really used now, five years afterwards, it's still something that inspires very different groups, even interest groups and, and therapists and so on. Sorry. <laughs> But it's also inspiring the organization. So after this liminal phase, the organization understood, wow, there is something in there. There is a lot that we can use. And it's not only for outreach. Of course, they use uh, Agent Unicorn as an, out as an object for outreach to talk about their senses. But it also helped them to open up to new interest groups. So uh, they started with a hackathon series where they invited designers and makers. So they suddenly opened up their medical devices and the knowledge about their medical devices to, to a new group for new insights. And they, would, they, never, they told me they never expected so many new insights uh, from uh, an actually lay group and new directions from a lay group uh, because they did hackathons before, but only with professionals with PhDs in the field and so on. So it, it, it opened up a completely new dimension for them and a completely new opportunity to for public engagement, but also to communicate about their work and uh, develop it further. And they also developed uh, uh, the unicorn kit, which is available for this group of people at a lower price than the standard scientific uh, equipment they have. And they even went on collaborating with uh, Anouk Wipprecht till now, uh, even for the new sensors, they created a new art project that inspires. Uh, and it has been on the cover of the IEEE uh, review <laughs> and so on. So it, it, it's really inspiring many people, really opening up to new ideas and new connections without really having a this one outcome that is usable right from the beginning. It, it started as, as, as this speculative design project. Uh, so this is something I find really interesting because it really helps people to get rid of these constraints that they often block themselves when they are in corporate organizations. You see this a lot that people are suddenly getting narrower and narrower and narrower, narrower because they feel these constrained structures and routines suppressing their ideas and not daring to say them out loud. Um, yeah, but also opening up to new new interest groups. Um, I find this a very interesting and, and, and beautiful example. Um, yeah, now I jump to the next, <laughs> to the next uh, um, theoretical, cluster, I would say, because uh, I want to discuss the next few projects under the umbrella of aesthetics, but um, connecting to different aspects. So um, I, again, start with a short video.
as I see that we're already past 40 minutes, I <laughs> am afraid from showing you the full video, uh, but uh, you get the impression. So aesthetics and, and playing with aesthetics is a very important point to understand what is happening, much more important in many instances than um, understanding something rationally. So in the case of Victoria Vesna's uh, noise aquarium, we might be aware that there is plankton in the ocean and we might be aware of the noise that we don't hear as a human because we're not exposed to it. But um, this project really managed to immerse uh, people into this environment to understand and to make connections. But it also, uh, as Victoria always says, uh, helped her to discover a, a lot of um, research that's there around plankton, uh, communicate a lot of interesting aspects around plankton, uh, how much they are contributing to the uh, oxygen in our, in, in our um, air that we breathe, and how little research there is uh, around noise and how um, plankton reacts to noise. And um, I don't actually want to stop with communication. And I don't think that communication and creating awareness is all that there is. But I think it's also interesting to understand a little better what can happen and what are all these different dimensions that we can experience and maybe not can't express rationally and, and with words and with arguments, but rather have to understand from an aesthetic point of view so that we can create really impactful art science projects. So um, I now want to talk a little bit, a little bit about uh, something that's used in social sciences a lot um, to talk about aesthetics and that's organizational aesthetics. And it connects to aesthetics uh, different uh, social scientific theories, like how we use symbolism, practice-based studies and so on. But I want to show a video that shows best what organizational aesthetics is. So um, what I find really interesting about this video is that it's not that it's uh, 
quite old, <laughs> but that it shows that aesthetics and how we can analyze and approach aesthetics is much more than the visuals and the sound we hear and the visuals and, 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 and immersive space that we might experience, but it is also very much uh, connected to what we do, to our rhythms, to how we work, to how we know what we are doing, how we get disturbed, um, and, and maybe also how we can break up routines or ask critical questions and, and, and start to break up um, different uh, aspects that we question. So um, as I said before, um, organizational aesthetics has been developed within, uh, of course, organization and management science, but in close connection to practice-based studies, uh, sociology and cultural studies, uh, thinking about what is the culture that we live in and how, do this, how does this translate to work and what we do and what we know. And um, of course, one example is the assembly line, uh, how, what happens when we break the rhythm, what happens when we disturb at a certain point in time, what happens to all the others before or behind us. Uh, but also what happens uh, in, in, in office work, how do we work, how do we get disturbed, how do we interact, what is more important to interact or to, to get disturbed, um, how do we uh, learn craft, what is the static uh, knowledge and the embodied knowledge we have when we learn and embody a, a craft, um, when you're a uh, either this, this chair maker or a carpenter or whatever, you get at a certain point in time where you can't describe it, but you need to experience and you need to feel something. Or how do we communicate in teams? How do we communicate as a leader? Uh, all these different dimensions and, and how is this in a culture, how is this understood in a cultural context? So this is the, the, the very essence of organizational aesthetics. And I find that this lens is very helpful when you really want to understand how art science collaboration can bring a break routines, ask critical questions that really affect those in the scientific position or uh, or really bring up uh, issues that are there. For example, when we start to work with our digital twin, what happens because somehow this is not embodied and, and I have suddenly, I have to work with a digital, digitalized work process while I'm used to be in my body and I can't ignore my body. So all these interesting questions come up here. And uh, I really like, I like this quote uh, or this, this understanding by, Baumgarten, uh, aesthetics as science of sensitive cognition, because this is as important as the visuals or the aesthetics that we see and analyzing that, but also how we experience it and learn it and how we connect it to our social environment and to, to our routines and our knowledge. So um, looking at understanding what we do uh, from this very aesthetic point of view, um, our science projects can be really interesting when you start to work with digitalization, with robots, um, trying not to impose a, a, a technological uh, aesthetic on the human, like um, harsh movements or whatever, but trying to create an equilibrium between the human uh, knowledge, the embodied knowledge, the human movements and the machine. So uh, Su Quen Tung um, is an artist who is, who is working a lot in this field um, with her here Mutations of Presence, where she uh, combines um, an analytical software tools and a robotic arm and her personal interpretation and the collaborative experience. Um, this actually uh, developed from the collaborative drawings that she did um, before, where it was about the collaboration process between the robot and her, um, which evolved uh, to a project to did with experiments in art and technology at Nokia Bell Labs, which was Omnia Pro Omnia, where they also included uh, knowledge or information from a, a, a surveillance uh, algorithm. 
and try to really understand what is the human aspect and what is the human understanding of these movements of 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 how can we relate to it as a human and this is where uh, at the beginning i said humanizing technology is one of these big things why people are talking about um, art science and art tech collaboration and this is one of the the main issues also for for nokia bell labs uh, which i find uh very well represented in the work that they did with a super and Chung, where they really tried to um, understand the human and emotional and, and aesthetic component. Um, another aspect where I also think that it's important to think about aesthetics is uh, the work of Robertina Shubjanic, uh, which is uh, an aesthetic that's in many dimensions often underestimated its sound and, and the analysis of sound. And um, her project, Aquatocene, uh, in her project, Aquatocene, she worked with a lot of different scientists and did residencies and so on. But interestingly, um, her work also inspired um, marine biologists who did not even work with her only by experiencing her work to rethink their own research methods and to use her material as data for their scientific work, which I find really interesting because this certainly helps you or the, the aesthetic experience of what she records and how she presents it helps the scientists to rethink what they what their methodologies are to understand a certain problem that they are researching and that it might add a new dimension there. Just. Aquatocene, the subaquatic quest for serenity, investigates the phenomenon of underwater noise pollution caused by humankind in the world's oceans and seas. The audio compositions of the subaquatic soundscape encourage us to reflect upon the anthropogenic sonic impact on the underwater habitat and marine life. When we look up to the sky, look into space and wonder about what is up there, we sometimes forget that there is still a lot left for us to explore on the planet we live on. We know more about space than we know about the world's oceans and seas. Uh, I don't have time to, to show the full video, but I, I'm happy to share the link. Uh, but what I find interesting here, it's, it's not so much, um, uh, although she's dealing with a similar issue as Victoria Vesna in, in, in the noise aquarium, it's not so much about getting immersed in that, but to understand how the noise really can affect animal and how, how it can also, how it intermingles and what kind and what layers of noise are there and how it can uh, reflect back on, diff on, on specific regions and animals in, in the ocean. So I really find this interesting that this artistic and aesthetic investigation by an artist inspires scientists to rethink their methods to understand more about what they are doing. And in a similar vein, um, another, another uh, scientist was talking to me about his project where he, um, uh, as a cosmologist, um, investigated um, the development of uh, the universe at a certain point in time. And although he did his, his work uh, based as he understood as a physicist and a mathematician, it was very difficult to get his head around a certain question in his data. And just by um, discussing uh, sound waves and, and the understanding and experience of sound with his uh, uh, electric guitar teacher and by playing guitar, he suddenly understood the aesthetics of what he knows in his data and what he sees in his data differently, which helped him to overcome this um, problematic situation in his analysis. So again, it's a very, what you, although you can understand something rationally, 
aesthetics can be a, an important clue to overcome uh, something that does not really fit or that doesn't feel right or that doesn't give you uh, any kind of imagination or feeling how to proceed. So sometimes aesthetics and experiencing different ways of um, or different aesthetics of one thing helps to, to move on. And this is also true for communication. And here we are talking about the communication of very complex principles. And although um, this project by Quadrature uh, developed after the residency at the European Southern Observatory um, does not really exactly show how um, uh, the binary prin uh, the principle of how binary stars find an equilibrium, it very much um, shows or gives the feeling of what happens and how, how fragile this balance is. So sometimes even in, in science communication or communicating the core aspect, um, the aesthetics and the experience watching this can be much more effective than explaining the whole theory. And I just see that I'm nearly at 60 minutes. So <laughs> I prepared way too much. I wanted to tell you everything. Uh, so I better just... Um, jump to the last few slides, um, skipping some projects, and um, just how to explain a little bit in a very, in, in a few sentences, few minutes, how I use this or how I try to use this to translate um, what I feel is so important about interdisciplinarity, bringing in the arts and what I see in all these theories to, real life projects and to art science residencies or, or collaborations in different situations. So uh, what, I, what I find very important is really thinking about what is the added value and what is what we are talking about. So um, I find it really super important to go beyond this, these shortcuts saying, oh, I want creativity or uh, when I bring in the arts, I get creativity for free. That's not the case. I really need to create this interaction. I really need to understand what is happening there because sometimes even when I have an interesting outcome, if I don't look in a way that I understand what's happening in the process and in these interactions, I don't see them and I think it's worthless. So even when I talk about creativity, I don't go into the detail of these theories now, but it's important to understand creativity does not come is, is not happening in a vacuum and it's not a virus that infects everybody that's getting close to somebody else who is creative but there are so many different levels that i that can heighten or the probability of me being creative on an individual level on how i create the um the group how i put together the group or how i create the organizational structure what kind of skills I train the people uh, I'm working with and so on, what kind of expertises are coming together that um, 
is very much reflected in all these different aspects I showed before that it's already something very obvious yes there is some something about creativity happening but maybe not in the sense that it's understood because it's heightening the the, the prob probability for creative processes and for people getting more creative but it's not creativity in the sense of i immediately get a creative outcome i really have to look at the process um and here um this is again something that I think that's 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 a very interesting example because uh, Magda Menezes' project, project Nature was not so much um, such an innovative outcome because the technology she used to manipulate the wings uh, or the, the 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 color of the wings of the butterflies was not a new one, but she asked really interesting questions by asking what is natural, how do we understand natural, what is artificial, and also raising awareness that there is not only a, a genomic or a genetic uh, opportunity to change our bodies, but that there are other opportunities and that we need to understand what is, um, what is, um, what is natural, what is artificial, but we also need to understand that there are hypes even in science that we need to ask also different questions, although we might be blinded at a certain point in time by a specific discipline or by a specific, a specific hype, a specific important scientific discovery. Or another project which uh, had really interesting outcomes, uh, Jonas Sur and and uh, Oren Katz and Guy Ben Ari, who did the embodied uh, cuisine uh, project, starting from a residency at the Harvard Medical Lab where they um, grew the grew artificially grew meat, uh, which was not very much uh, an a scientific question and not very much a corporate question or industrial question for them because they wanted to produce artificially meat or, or, or save the world. But the questions they raised and the project they did opened up a lot of different new ways and corridors for other people to explore. And this is, I think, that makes uh, or that, that is a good example to show that the process is important, but also the outcome, but the outcome might not be um, the innovation everybody is waiting for, but the innovation or the innovative perspective and the important question other people then can explore to be innovative. To be innovative. <clears throat> so um, really keeping in mind that what do we want to reach with the residency and how do we understand the process and how do we understand all these different possibilities helps us to frame the goals, but also uh, to understand how we then create the conditions for a residency or for our science collaboration or an interdisciplinary project to be really uh, beneficial. So we need to think this through. What does also the encounter with art and aesthetics do? What do we know from previous residencies where where are interesting aspects in the in the process and not only in the outcome uh, people very much tend to look to the outcome but the outcome is not everything and then uh, how can we uh, create a situation that is beneficial to 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 make our science collaboration thrive and here again uh, that's why i also really wanted to point it out the uh liminal spaces and liminality but also the idea of um organizational aesthetics where it's also about very much about routines and and implicit knowledge what are the processes that might uh, affect uh, the residency or the collaboration negatively and what are the things that we need to create in our organization to make this really a beneficial and interesting collaboration. And then there can be really some, some uh, yeah, important things or small things that are super important, like giving access to specific uh, groups or departments, um, uh, in, um, making sure that the communication is right, making sure that the, um, the whole project is understood as something that's has an important process. Um, 
and, and this can be created by understanding what are the different needs of the different parties. So what does the organization need? Um, with whom am I dealing? What do managers of this organization need to report to their uh, bosses? All these things are super important to understand when I create these residences, when I, when I want to make it really thrive and make this what I showed in the in the in the cases uh, that I want this to happen, but also to create this environment where I, I, I can talk about the process and the implications of the process and not only about a final outcome which has to deliver. And then of course, what is what do the individuals need and what is the bigger picture in which this is happening? And yeah, there's just some some um, very practical issues that I wanted to mention how um, to make these processes even more impactful. And what I experience is that it needs a lot of guidance, a lot of translation between disciplines, between different um, perspectives, different expectations. You have to manage expectations. Uh, there's always something about dealing with different micropolitics, status, behavior, whatever. Very, very human dynamics in every organization, maybe a cultural organization, scientific organization, or a corporation. Uh, and, and to manage this, you need also to learn to translate to these different groups, uh, to put the process of the project into perspective for all of these groups. Uh, talk to them in their language and manage the expectations. And what I also always try to say and, and really push for in all these projects that are realized with different organizations is that it's critical to have the resources uh, such as time, space and openness, which means it needs to be something that happens within uh, the work time and not as a as a project that's uh, in the evening or it needs to get some kind of priority space um, but also uh, interaction on on eye height <laughs> so it's it's not something that we give you information and you make something beautiful as you're the artist it's, it's really a, a collaboration and it needs openness from both sides uh, which in the end, boils down to managerial support, financial support, and that the people are not afraid to do not know something uh, or to, to be the ones who don't know a specific aspect. Yeah, so that's the, the most important parts there. Um, very quickly, because I'm 10 minutes, <laughs> I've, been, I've been talking too long. A little bit of the bibliography. Um, I can send you the list if you like. It's just it's just a selection. Um, thank you.